So tonight we have uh, something, uh, we have Andrew Holder here uh, for something that I am personally extremely excited about uh, and that I think will be quite special and that uh, is frankly a little bit brave. Uh, so Andrew will be presenting tonight lecture the movie which is the culmination of three days of work that he's been doing with a group of uh, architecture students here uh, at the Knowlton School. Uh, now I will sort of leave it to Andrew to describe or maybe not describe uh, what it is we're about to encounter. Um, but in the meantime, I wanted to say uh, something before he begins about being uh, an audience of Andrew's work uh, because I think it's in a way our status as audience members through which we can begin to parse what it is that Andrew uh, and his co-principal Klaus Benjamin Freinger of the LADG, uh, the Los Angeles Design Group, are sort of up to. Uh, Andrew has a knack for putting his audience, which tonight will be us, into slightly uncomfortable positions. Uh, I have a, 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 a suspicion that tonight will be presented with a kind of particular density of things. Uh, and some of these things we may be able to name, so things like uh, walls, roofs, maybe arches, uh, and others will be less nameable, so baby-like things or pig-like things or baby pig-like things uh, and so forth. Now, as you witness this sort of succession of things, you may feel a certain anxiety uh, about a kind of threat that I think lurks beneath uh, much of LADG's numerous sort of houses, installations, and proposals. And that is uh, a certain threat that architecture might suddenly be asked to include everything. Uh, and then in fact our attention as audience members might be asked to be sort of more or less equally divided between things which are designed and things which aren't, between things which are in the foreground or the background and between figures uh, and the spaces around them. Now if this sounds difficult, in fact it, it gets worse, uh, which is to say that uh, it's, it's sort of not only uh, that we sort of encounter this possibility that architecture might be everything, uh, but at the same time this condition which Andrew has called a sufficient density of things uh, also threatens to sort of undermine the conventional categories through which we as architects typically make sense of our encounters with things. And by that I mean categories like rooms, corridors, uh, etc. Now, in other words, when we look at the work of LADG, we're confronted with a threat that everything might suddenly become architecture, including, for example, a lecture about architecture. Uh, and at the same time we're robbed of the conventions through which we might subdue this density of things into something more manageable. Now you might remember from various episodes in architectural history a kind of similar type of ambition. So for example, the kind of total surface projects of Florentine architecture in the 1960s or uh, Hans Holein's famous Alles ist Architektur Dictum uh, or more distantly uh, something like the British picturesque uh, or the German Baroque and their concern for the assembly of things, how we put things together. Uh, and in fact Andrew's work demonstrates a kind of keen desire to learn from these different histories, particularly the, the, the sort of older of these four histories, uh, but it also shows an ambition to take these histories somewhere new, presenting us not only with the possibility of everything, uh, but also skillfully resisting everything's tendency to disintegrate into a kind of formlessness. And it's here I think that we, as Andrew's audience for the night, uh, sort of come in. The threat of an everything, which is nevertheless formed, though seldom in a manner that we can make immediate sense of, is one of the ways in which the LADG produces a special kind of tension that asks us to encounter architecture always from a position of uncertainty. You might feel certain that you're seeing something very specific and at the same time unable to rely on the categories through which you've been trained to make sense of these kinds of specificities. The work we'll see tonight will ask us, the audience, to join Andrew in the collective formulation of new categories. In other words, the, th the thing that I think is really special about Andrew's work is that you and I have already been included in this specific density of things to come. Along with Andrew's role as a co-principal of the LADG, uh, he's also an assistant professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's previously taught at the University of Michigan and received his Master's of Architecture from uh, UCLA. Andrew, uh, both individually and with the LADG, has received numerous honors, including the Oberdijk Fellowship in Michigan, the Architecture League Prize from the Architecture League of New York, uh, as well as numerous citations uh, from the AIA uh, as Los Angeles chapter. So please join me in welcoming Andrew Holder.
a few thanks first. Uh, so um, first, thanks to Curtis. I, that was an extremely generous and articulate introduction. And I might uh, crib some of your thinking for my next essay on our work. Uh, also, thanks to Todd, um, who's an old friend of mine from Los Angeles. And I'm, I'm so pleased to see you here. This is uh, really wonderful to be, to be at o OSU. Um, I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't thank the workshop participants who are uh, all with us in a form uh, right now. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Klaus Benjamin Freinger and uh, our uh, design staff at the LADG uh, in Los Angeles. So uh, without further ado. Uh, so much of our recent work actually begins with this building. Um, this is called the Asamkirche. Uh, it's in Munich, Germany. And I would actually like to make the case that it is not a building at all. It was built by the Azam brothers over a period from about 1736 to 1742. Uh, Cosmas Damien and Igid Kirin Azam, the Azam brothers, uh, purchased a collection of three row houses and demolished the center one and filled the interval or the gap between those two row houses uh, with a collection of objects that they had designed. So uh, they made their fortunes decorating church interiors. Uh, and so the Azam Kirka is kind of the apotheosis of their work. Um, there are a couple of contextual clues that this is not so much a building, but a glut of objects that have been arranged in sufficient density uh, to sort of approximate the behavior of a building. So the first clue, I would say, uh, is the plane of glass above the primary entryway. You can see that it's sort of stuck on from behind as though it's been applied post facto uh, to a collection of things that was already in place before the glass arrived. Uh, also on the interior, on the two longitudinal surfaces, there are what look like doors and windows, but these are actually not doors and windows in the elevation of the church itself. They, they do not belong to the envelope of the church. I would argue that it has none. Uh, instead, they are holes that provide access uh, into Igid Kirin's house on the left uh, and the priest's house on the right. So Igid Kirin actually has a door where he walks out of his parlor and uh, onto the balcony of the church so he can take mass. Uh, and the priest has a similar door that he opens uh, with direct access to the pulpit. In thinking about this project, uh, our office um, has developed something of a cone. So architecture is a sufficiently dense collection of things. Uh, that's the cone. And the purpose of a cone in meditative practice is to repeat it often enough that it begins to engender profound doubts about something you thought you knew quite well. So we repeat over and over again in the office, architecture is a sufficiently dense collection of things, and we do it in order to engender three doubts. So doubt first about the status of the envelope. Must the envelope be the thing uh, that determines absolutely the limits of a building? Uh, or perhaps if we're thinking about proximities between objects, uh, can other properties of objects uh, undertake that role and displace the envelope as absolute delimiter? Uh, the second doubt that we hope to engender is preposition doubt. Um, so if normally a building is governed by one dominant preposition, it rests on the ground, uh, we want things next to one another, on top of one another, around one another, and those prepositions might overflow to include the people in the building and the people adjacent to the building. Uh, the third and final doubt that we're hoping to engender is completion doubt. Uh, that almost anything might be added to a building. We would consider human bodies also to be the stuff of architecture when they enter a building. Uh, but there is no uh, necessary sort of final state to an architectural project. You can sort of add and subtract uh, at will. And we would argue that's, that's already always happening. But perhaps if we sort of take this doubt seriously, um, we might uh, produce another kind of architecture. So together, these three doubts uh, about the envelope, about the prepositions that govern a building, and about completeness uh, form a kind of umbrella or frame within which you might begin to understand some of our recent work. And I would like to take you through um, a series of six projects uh, very briefly here. Um, that take up those doubts uh, in different ways. So beginning with one called uh, 48 characters. 
48 Characters uh, is a project that I did at the University of Michigan while I was a fellow there in 2012-2013. And the intellectual point of departure for it was thinking through this issue of sufficient density as it relates to the brick. Um, so bricks as we know it, we thought could be sort of summed up in these four images, where geometry is always the excuse to fit or stack things next to one another. So what do I mean by that as geometry as being the thing that authorizes the fit? Well, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the Marshall Fields Wholesale Building, uh, there are these face-to-face -face matches between very large blocks of rusticated stonework. And despite the surface rustication and the texture, we still know that those face-to-face -face matches are in there and that a rectangle is meeting a rectangle. And because of that match of face-to-face -face geometries, uh, it authorizes the stack of the wall. Uh, Greg Lynn's Blob Wall project in the lower left bends the plane of that face-to-face -face match uh, into uh, three dimensions, but still um, the parts on both sides of the fit sort of lose their identity in favor of the press between objects in a way that's not so dissimilar to the Marshall Fields Wholesale Building. Um, continuing to move around to the lower right, that's Rhonda Losh's PS1 competition entry from several years ago. It's called Grotto. There, there's an attempt to disguise uh, the face-to-face -face match of um, adjacent geometries um, through this appearance of irregular polygonal boulders. But if you start to interrogate any one of those joints, it's perhaps a hexagon on one side and a hexagon on another. And then for me, the kind of uh, intellectual limit of this way of thinking about the relationship between the, the brick uh, and geometry as an excuse to fit would be Moss's rainbow vomit in the upper right, uh, where actually all of these cubes are standing on point refusing to fit even though their faces uh, like are clearly identical to one another. Um, so we've decided to uh, try to offload the work of geometry to character uh, instead and interrogate the possibilities for uh, stacking and assembly that might emerge from uh, character as opposed to working with bricks. Um, so I think first when you're working with a character and trying to sort of define it with respect to the, uh, the physical stuff of architecture, uh, we need to ask like what is it that I mean by a character? And this is a diagram that we would use as a sieve or a kind of sorting mechanism to sort out uh, characters from other kinds of forms. And I'd like to read this spectrum in two ways. So the first is simply about formal articulation. For, so for our office, a character sits midway between uh, platonic solids and embryos. It's kind of like medium articulate. The second way we would read this diagram uh, is in terms of the representational capacities of each of these lines. Uh, so platonic solids are exactly never themselves. They are always pointing to an ideal uh, that they can never fully attain. Uh, and maybe embryos we would think about as always in a process of becoming. They're, in this case, it's pointing toward a sort of incipient chicken. Um, but in both cases, those geometries at the top and the bottom are in some sense not themselves. Uh, so for us, the middle band would occupy this very special place in terms of representation where it's a kind of thing in itself. It appears to have a name or solicit naming, um, but I would defy anyone to say like, oh, that's a giraffe or a dog. Um, so it has this sort of different representational aspect to it. Um, then the question is, if you sort of defined for yourself what a character is, um, how might you make one? And so uh, we actually constructed a set of tools uh, specifically for the purpose of manufacturing characters. And each of these uh, was designed with the idea that the tool uh, would make a kind of imprint on a, a, a balloon filled with plaster. Um, but it would make that imprint in such a way that you could never reconstruct the idea of the tool um, from the imprint itself. So we would say that it's a kind of uh, non-index making tool, uh, that you can't tell that it was an, an egg or a stick that made that first imprint. Uh, and so when we start to evaluate the resultant forms, uh, 
I think you can see that they have this quality of sort of retaining the characteristics of our uh, diagram where we're slowly uh, kind of torturing a balloon into position uh, using these tools, um, but at the end sort of emerging with something that is more than just kind of an accrual of the action of the tool. It is, again, has this quality of being a, a kind of thing in itself. Um, so uh, here's, this is a view of the, the balloon animals in process. And again, these are just plaster filled balloons that were kind of working with fishing line and poking with these kind of egg shaped stabbers. And then you can start to see some of the finished results. And then if we move on uh, from the finished results, they were all hanging in the gallery uh, in these kind of sacks. Uh, and we can take a look at the installation view. So in the gallery, uh, it's a series of these pedestals um, that are about the height of a human body. Uh, and they are covered with these plaster objects that we would call um, balloon animals. Uh, and so I would like to, in a second, we'll talk about the kind of draped figuration of those pedestals. Uh, but first, maybe let's zoom in a little bit and uh, take a look at the relations between uh, animals um, on some of the detail shots of the exhibition. So if bricks have this quality of face-to-face -face matches that authorize things like uh, walls that occur in stacks, um, these we would call a snuggle fit, where it's sort of bodily interactions that are governing uh, the, the relationships between things. And they're, they're not mysterious bodily interactions. They're kind of, uh, they occur in a common language, like snuggling and copulating their way toward uh, the production of the space. Um, I mentioned the drapery on the pedestals earlier, and I would like to talk a bit more about that, um, because it has to do with the way that we're conceiving of making a ground in this project. So um, for us, it was very important that we never released the idea of one thing stacking atop another. Um, we never wanted a kind of absolute limit after which uh, this, this stack would no longer be operative. Um, and so uh, we're going to uh, sort of some significant design work to make it appear as though there are things underneath the pedestals uh, that might continue all the way down. Um, so next, you guys. All right, uh, and so here you see a series of diagrams that are kind of implying the posture of a possible creature uh, that might exist underneath those pedestals. And next again, please. Uh, and the idea is that because you can't actually see uh, the objects underneath that uh, drapery, which is in fact a carved MDF, that there is this implication that there may actually be objects uh, that continue all the way down to the ground. Um, so in physics, we would call this uh, the kind of infinite regression problem or uh, turtles all the way down. And so here we're seeing a kind of uh, simulacrum of those pedestals uh, with, again, the idea being that we've uh, sort of prolonged the stack. And for you guys upstairs, we're going to go a little faster for the next project, OK? All right, uh, next up. Um,
is a project called um, the Oyster Gourmet. Uh, and so this is a project that we did in Grand Central Market um, and Grand Central Market for those of you uh, who might have been to Los Angeles is this kind of staple of the downtown food scene and it's undergoing a sort of dramatic change where a new wave of restaurants uh, is moving in. Uh, we were commissioned by this guy, Christophe Happion, who's a master écolier. It basically just means he's a master oyster shucker and he opened the Oyster Gourmet as uh, a champagne and oyster bar. Uh, and our intellectual point of entry for this project uh, is the idea of character, but again, but returning to it in a slightly different way. So um, normally when we understand character and architecture, uh, we think of it like this. Um, where character is the thing that allows us to discern the difference between these two sets of chairs. So uh, on the left, uh, a French Regence Rococo chair, and on the right, uh, two Chippendale Rococo chairs. And character would be the total set of formal attributes that allow you to tell the difference between these two. But it's essentially about being able to find the thing in a system of relationships that works almost like a table where you can look them up, let's say, if you know uh, the shape of the foot. But there is another kind of character. Uh, this is the character. These are self-portraits uh, by Jean-Jacques Lequeu. Um, and with the character, all of that specificity that we found in character sort of comes home to roost in the flesh. Uh, it's the arrival of character in the body. And Adorno would say that the character is a person with a rigidified personality per pattern impervious to life experience, precisely because of that kind of overwhelming accumulation of detail. Uh, in the body. And so the character tends to be kind of insensitive with respect to context. Uh, they are mechanically inelastic. They don't accommodate themselves uh, with respect to their environment and that's why uh, the character is lovable. And so we wanted to think about the ways in which we could uh, translate the character to architecture um, in a way that was perhaps a little bit different uh, than what we had accomplished with uh, the Balloon Animal Project, 48 characters. So we did this in two ways. Uh, the first is to really take on this issue of mechanical inelasticity. At night, um, the oyster gourmet is closed up like a shell. Uh, and then during the day, Christoph uh, goes in in the morning and kind of cranks everything open with this uh, nautical grade winch and it takes a lot of effort to get the thing to sort of move open. Uh, and um, it does the same thing. It's this repetitive behavior day after day, sort of no matter what's happening in the context of Grand Central Market. And in fact, Grand Central Market is always changing. New, new tenants are coming in. It's a, a new cast of characters every day. Uh, but we just have this kind of mechanical up and down motion. Uh, the second way in which we're trying to accrue character uh, would be through detail. Um, so the job of detail in architecture, I mean, there are a lot of different roles, maybe one of the most common if we're thinking uh, of sort of classical detailing a la Bramante. The job of the detail would be to relate small things to big ideas. Uh, so that there would be a very clear intellectual lineage just by staring at the detail, you could start to get some sense of its position within the whole. Uh, but with the character, maybe it's a little bit different. It's about details actually getting stuck in the body and sort of refusing to be taken back up into kind of easy diagrammatic conversations. So I'm going to draw your attention in quick succession here to uh, the shape of the bar on the interior and exterior, uh, and then also a couple of structural details. So the shape of the bar on the exterior is a kind of lobed circle, and on the interior it's a, a six-sided shape. Uh, but the line that delineates the interior is actually interrupted by one of the dishwashing sinks, so you can't tell if it's supposed to be a kind of closed shape or a sort of open-ended line that just trails off. Uh, in terms of structural, structural detailing, um, there's this kind of play between wood and metal on the awnings, uh, these leaves that raise up. Uh, in fact, we don't really need the aluminum struts. Um, they do a little bit of work to stiffen the awnings, but uh, they're more decorative. Um, but then when we get into uh, some of the uh, steel detailing on the kind of birdcage-like frame, 
Um, we need the steel, but not the wood. So these two materials are always sort of tracing one another uh, and reiterating one another's form, uh, but neither one is entirely essential, uh, or they, they sort of take turns being essential, even though they, they play this game of, of tracing one another. So I think for us, um, social media is maybe a kind of interesting index of this thing's success. Uh, it's one of the only things that we've done that's popular in a kind of conventional sense of the word. It almost functions as a sort of selfie booth uh, where people uh, go and take pictures of themselves uh, eating uh, and drinking at the Oyster Gourmet. Um, so in that sense, maybe it's achieved a kind of presence that would operate as the character as opposed to simply having, having character. All right, the next project is House in Los Angeles. Okay, and we're going to keep that pace. That's working. <laughs> Better. Um, so the story of this project uh, is that we were commissioned by um, a, a couple who are both artists. Um, and he's a large format painter and muralist, and she is a photographer. Uh, and they found this very interesting site in LA, uh, up in the hills, um, that is almost entirely landlocked. So it's accessed only by this kind of narrow, 100 foot long driveway. Um, but the yard proper is really totally enclosed so that they, they back up to all of their neighbor's fences. So for us, it's a kind of dream commission because it's already putting, this, putting pressure on this uh, issue of density and we have a contained field within which to play out our experiments. Um, so beyond the, the kind of landlocked parcel, um, the kind of second moment of interest about this commission is uh, that we are uh, responding to some existing buildings. Um, and we are adding to them, we're only demolishing one of three that exists, uh, adding to the other two, and the style of uh, those other two is of interest to us. So there, we would call them both fairly typical um, post-war ranch homes. So of course there are hundreds of thousands of ranch homes uh, built in the late 30s, 40s, uh, and on into the 50s in Los Angeles. Uh, the style was kind of popularized as a form of California living uh, by Sunset Magazine in partnership with this guy named Cliff May. Uh, so Cliff May is sort of the doyen of the ranch house. Um, he's the master, and maybe this is his masterwork. It's the um, house. Uh, by the family responsible, responsible for Anderson's Pea Soup, which is a kind of institution on the 101. So the, the Anderson's Pea Soup fortune built this house. And we're interested in um, the disarticulation of the roof from the objects underneath. So unlike most houses, uh, the ranch house uh, does not necessarily set up wall subdivisions based on the kind of structural logic of the roof. Uh, instead, there's a slippage um, between the two. And we were interested in that with respect to the way Cliff May describes his houses. So he had this habit of speaking in what we would call reversible statements. Uh, so a good example of a reversible statement is outdoors is as private as indoors. So that's, that's a kind of comment about his own work. Um, in reversible statements, you can flip the position of the nouns and it doesn't really matter. So uh, indoors is as private as outdoors, outdoors is as private as indoors. Uh, it has this kind of reversible quality uh, that we were maybe interested in taking on uh, in built form and asking what might this mean in terms of space if uh, space is reversible with respect to objects, which just means that space, interior space can be maybe initiated on both sides. So we did this little intellectual exercise. Well, well how would we draw that? Um, maybe starting with a nine square grid. So there's, there's the nine square as we know it. If we look at it in perspective, uh, with a kind of single vanishing point, it looks about like you'd expect, uh, sort of like an advent calendar. This is the construction of space as we know it. Uh, but maybe we could do something uh, slightly different by drawing it as a series of nine one-point perspectives so that every wall is given a kind of absolutely equivalent status in terms of its ability to uh, project a sense of space making outward from its surface. Um, and so we could then think through maybe, well, how would we redraw some of Cliff May's plans? Here's the sort of standard extrusion looking down into uh, a tract home that he designed uh, in the late 1940s in Long, Long Beach. 
Uh, and if we were to redraw this according to uh, sort of our theory of how we would rework perspective, it might look like this. Uh, as a like a kind of ziggurat of chamfered walls where um, you're always kind of the same distance from the implied center uh, because there is this interest in the solid as doing the, the work of initiating space making. Um, so the problem became then how if we don't want to build a house with chamfered walls or maybe if chamfered walls don't actually uh, like realize this project, um, how would we sort of create this uh, same idea about the, the production of space with respect to the solids in the project? Uh, and so we basically took uh, one of Cliff May's ranch homes and made a few adjustments to the interior walls and further disarticulated roof from wall uh, with the hope of creating something kind of like a continuous interior so that there are a series of corners uh, that don't bracket a single room but instead are kind of bracketing a series of things that are sort of room-like but uh, are constantly in the process of, of opening up to one another. Uh, and so if we then look at the site plan, you can see how this plays out. Um, there's the existing house, a guest house, and then a carport. The carport is the first thing that uh, so we actually contributed. So that's existing house, guest house. Uh, then we're gonna get a point, a finger to the carport, followed by a finger to the studio. Uh, and so this drawing is a bit tricky. Yeah, you're seeing the walls in plan and the roofs of, of our additions have actually been sort of blown off and are laying on the side. Here's a closer view of the studio. Uh, you can see the disarticulation of the walls and that the entryways are being handled as, uh, as these slippages at soft corners. Uh, there's a bathroom hanging out uh, at one end. Uh, I suppose next. Uh, then this is the carport. Uh, there's access to a courtyard um, between the carport and the main house and then another courtyard uh, between the carport and the studio. Uh, and so uh, given this kind of smattering of walls across the site, we were interested as we drew it and as we worked through the details uh, to continue to try and sort of hammer away on our idea about both the production and the, and the perception of space. So there are a series of sections uh, where we're drawing them as uh, bays where each wall is initiating its own one point perspective that's receding in space. So all of these uh, more or less look kind of like an advent calendar. And we're going to pay particular attention to uh, the bathroom at the studio. Uh, so in addition to this being a kind of method of drawing um, where we have these sort of compartments of space that are initiated by the walls, we're thinking about how the walls push and pull on the area to either side. Uh, so that's pretty normal uh, in the way, can you guys please zoom in on the little lady in the bathroom? Um, we're thinking of, so that, that's more or less business as usual um, on the interior surfaces of walls. Um, but maybe things are a bit different uh, on the exterior. So you'll see that we're expressing cavities uh, from the interior also as these kind of like architecton-like bumps on the exterior. So this has gone to somewhat ab absurd extremes. The, the little compartment for the toilet paper holder is actually extruded as a bump into the courtyard and the same goes for the, the vanity above the sink. Uh, but essentially never letting a wall um, operate in service of simply the interior, or we could think of it as sort of duplicating the interior uh, to both sides. Um, so we won't look at uh, the next artifacts in a lot of detail, um, other than to say that there are a series of movies that start to play this out. Um, the first being this pink one with the idea of the wall being free and non-orientable and somehow in dialogue with its digital self. Uh, models that sort of dramatize uh, the compositional process of uh, arranging these walls with respect to one another, uh, and then um, actually building the sort of chamfered wall model that I showed in drawing a, a few moments ago, uh, and thinking about how people might walk through that space and occupy it. All right. <clears throat> 
Um, so the next project is called Restaurant in Los Angeles. Uh, or, or restaurant in an undisclosed location. So I'm going to do this to you guys twice today. We, we have a couple of commissions that are currently uh, in kind of sensitive permitting uh, negotiations, and so um, we're not supposed to say precisely where they are. Uh, but I can show you uh, the way the project looked uh, at least a couple of months ago in schematic design in our office. Um, so the story of this is that it's an inherited project. Uh, another architect was working with the developer before uh, we started working with the developer. Um, and there were a couple of characteristics um, of the building as it was designed by the previous architect um, that were really wonderful from our point of view and we decided to keep. Um, and the, the first among those uh, was the idea of the building as a two-story, uh, freestanding, indoor-outdoor pavilion. So if I just kind of think through that, I think it's very common to have a sort of pavilion restaurant, partic particularly in Los Angeles, where uh, climate and conditioning aren't such a big deal. Um, but to have that stacked to two stories uh, is somewhat unusual, and then this is in a particular location where it puts additional pressure on this issue of conditioning. Um, and so to have that two-story pavilion um, made us ask, where else in history would we actually find a condition like that where you've got a, a sort of enormous uh, solid um, and human activity must map to its outsides? Um, and I think a kind of obvious antecedent maybe would be archaeology, um, where all of the kind of technologies of um, reconstruction or renovation uh, would be mapped to the surface uh, of the object that we're, we're restoring or studying or, or considering. Uh, and so in architecture, when we think about sort of archival recovery of a, of, uh, a sort of ancient solid, uh, maybe the first place we would look uh, would be uh, Auguste Choisy's drawings uh, that attempted to intellectually reconstruct uh, sort of several famous Roman ruins. And so in Choisy's case, um, he's interested in uh, drawing something that may or may not be factually correct, uh, but he wants to advocate for uh, his interpretation of the construction of the ruins as extensible models. So he meant that in two senses. Uh, the first is that they could extend in space. He's drawing these vault fragments in worm's eye projection, uh, and they're just little fragments of systems that go on um, in sort of much larger runs. Uh, but they're also supposed to be extensible in time, that uh, these are samples of the kind of masterworks of Roman building, uh, but these smaller versions and different versions per appeared all throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and so for us uh, to kind of map uh, to... Um, uh, <laughs> there's, there are other things going on in the background. Uh, so for us, it was important to sort of interrupt that idea of um, systemic expansion. Uh, that if we were going to produce uh, a kind of proper thing, that somehow we had to arrest the potentially uh, extensible qualities of uh, Choisy's drawings, um, which essentially means finding a way formally uh, to turn a system of vaults into a system of tables. So tables are this sort of hypostasized object. It's very difficult to imagine adding more legs, whereas vaults, uh, it's easy to imagine the, the extension of the, the system. Uh, and so we're doing that um, simply by reorganizing uh, the relationship between uh, the, the vault and its abutments and imposts. So a simpler way of saying it is that you have the vault that's curvilinear and above your head, and then you have where it transitions to uh, the kind of vertical stuff of the building. Uh, and we're shifting around that relationship uh, so that we can alternately contain people uh, in enclosed space and then sort of release uh, those enclosed spaces uh, at the edge of the building uh, where the table becomes more like a sort of conventional modernist slab. And so uh, we're thinking about those spatial consequences in a series of interior renderings where there are moments of total encapsulation. You're more or less inside uh, simply because um, 
the vault is working as you would expect it to in section and it's forming a kind of capsule above your head uh, and there are moments when you are released to the edge and you see this kind of slab-like extension uh, out particularly on the second floor and uh, that no longer produces that sense of interiority but instead sort of uh, releases space uh, at the limit of the building. Uh, and so we'll look at the plan briefly. Um, and I'd maybe like to emphasize uh, just two things about the plan um, and the section. Uh, all right, so I just want to emphasize two things, uh, a thing about the plan, a thing about the section. So um, the plan, all of the services are concealed within the sort of thick stuff of the abutment and imposts and the vaults. Uh, and you walk between them in a, a kind of progression from more open space to uh, a kind of greater degree of enclosure at the back. And then in the sections, there's a kind of slippage between the worlds. Um, so the, the spaces that are defined as sort of encapsulated on top, uh, that's not simply extruded down to the bottom. There's a kind of uh, intentional mismatch between those uh, two sets of zones. And the next project uh, is called The Kid Gets Out of the Picture. This is actually two projects, uh, one done in Los Angeles uh, and another done uh, in Loeb Library at the Harvard GSD. Uh, and they were executed simultaneously last summer. And um, maybe uh, the first of our interests here is in the idea of taking a picture uh, and thinking about how we could, let's say, reinflate or decompress uh, the space of the picture uh, so that it goes from being sort of glued to the picture plane to being, uh, again, occupiable. And I think uh, maybe the first place that you would turn if you're thinking about um, uh, please back up one. Uh, the first place that you would turn uh, if you're thinking about the inhabitation of the picture, of course, would be uh, the English picturesque. Um, and particularly the drawings of this guy named uh, William Gilpin. So Gilpin uh, is the uh, sort of dilettante uh, landscape architect uh, who first coins the term picturesque in relation to gardening. Um, he's actually a kind of religious man by, by trade, he's a clergyman, uh, but he spends a lot of his time traveling England, Scotland, and Wales, uh, sketching uh, while he rides his mule to go to visit his mother primarily, uh, and he starts to coin some of the fundamental terminology uh, of the picturesque. And the, the term that we're interested in uh, with respect to this issue of reinflating the picture plane is this word called the clump, which was a term of art in the, the English picturesque. Uh, that maybe doesn't hold the same meaning to contemporary years. So, so this drawing uh, is the clump. Uh, if there are three individual trees on the upper left, the clump are the three trees that have sort of been consolidated into a single entity uh, so that they can be drawn or painted as a single object. Uh, and what's interesting about the clump uh, is that it can grow. Um, so more stuff can be added to it. And in fact, as different authors take up the clump, it's sort of omnivorous and elastic. In this image, you see a clump that involves a, a living tree and a blasted or lightning struck tree, but together they would be called a clump. Uh, and this appetite is almost without limit. Uh, so we'll see examples of clumps uh, that incorporate uh, geology. So it's very difficult, for instance, to disambiguate the tree form uh, from the boulders on which it might be growing. Uh, so altogether, those might be considered a clump. Uh, and so as time goes on over a period of a few decades, authors encounter problems uh, where they cannot uh, they can never discount something as being potentially absorbed uh, into a clump, and that might um, include an entire landscape. And so uh, if the clump is responsible for the kind of compression of extreme heterogeneity onto the plane of the picture, uh, we want to do something like this, which is slice that space open and walk back into it.
Uh, and so our uh, first attempt to do that uh, is the first iteration of the kid gets out of the picture. This was at, in Los Angeles at Materials and Applications, which is a kind of nonprofit arts venue uh, on Silver Lake Boulevard that has a history of showing architectural installations. I should mention that we had a couple of really wonderful collaborators. So in addition to M and A, uh, we were working with Jason Payne, who contributed a large rock that you'll see, uh, Andrew Atwood and Anna Niemark, who contributed one of their dolmens, and Laurel Broughton and An Andrew Kovacs, who collaborated to produce a, a bench. Um, <clears throat> so we were working with this idea of the clump as being capable of absorbing uh, heterogeneous materials almost without limit. And so uh, we decided to sort of test that capacity by using lots of different kinds of construction materials and technologies that would be related to the reforming of grounds and yards. So the first, a bunch of eight by eight posts that might be used uh, to make a deck. Uh, then uh, a bunch of standard 8x8x4 eight by eight by cinder blocks that were stacked up in uh, large ziggurats in between uh, the sticks. Uh, and then a 10-foot diameter uh, storm culvert, stormwater drainage culvert that might be used uh, to drain water underneath freeways, or it's also used in kind of industrial agriculture. Uh, and then atop that entire assembly, um, a series of plaster blankets um, that are maybe more associated with the kind of digital conception of ground, uh, where we see it from the top down and imagine it to be this kind of thin uh, sheet. So we want to kind of think through the spatial consequences of having accrued this assembly, uh, which we hope hangs together in a kind of clump-like -like way despite its heterogeneity. Uh, and we would argue that there's a sort of choreography, beginning with the entry into the courtyard uh, through this culvert. Uh, that then delivers you into open space where you are free to kind of wander across uh, the hills of this pink blanket and hang out and have a beer uh, under the dolmen. And you'll start to see that there are uh, a series of crevices or pleats in the surface. Uh, and you can tuck underneath those pleats uh, and actually walk into another space underneath the hill that is similar to the culvert in its axiality, uh, but this time there's no pipe. Uh, instead, there's a sort of open promenade that delivers you back to the beginning uh, between these two uh, stacks of, of bricks. Um, and so we were sort of interested to see if that choreography held any water on opening night. In terms of starting to differentiate program and activity, uh, so uh, if we dispense with the idea of room, like how do we recover uh, the specificity of mapping human activity onto architecture? Uh, and although here maybe that wasn't our first agenda, we would argue that we saw this, the seeds of that beginning to happen, and so people are doing certain things in certain places. It's not as though uh, like everything happens everywhere. They kind of hike on the hills, uh, they hang out and have a beer underneath or, or, or by the dolmen, uh, and there is this kind of um, more or less deliberate placement of, of people with respect to the stuff of the, the installation. So we had a chance to do this again and actually open the second version just a couple of weeks later. So this is um, at Harvard uh, in what's called Loeb Library. Uh, and we're right on the ground floor next to the study carrels, sort of sandwiched in between the periodicals. It's a much tighter fit, obviously, than materials and applications. Uh, and so here was a chance to kind of uh, maybe speculate on some of the consequences of working in this way beyond a sort of gross uh, spatial choreography. Um, and we would argue maybe four things uh, in terms of the consequences that we're able to recover in exchange for working this way. So first, maybe extreme heterogeneity that is so fully naturalized that it almost looks boring. Uh, the second is a spongy and continuously navigable section. So it is not as though there is a kind of hallway uh, that you would walk down, uh, but instead the entire section uh, is freely navigable. Uh, the third property that uh, we were noticing in a kind of like post-game analysis of this thing is a sort of art-not-art art property. 
uh, that there is a free intermixing of artful objects that we have intensively worked uh, and almost unaltered materials that have just been uh, sort of stacked. And we would argue that conventionally in architecture, sort of the artful and the unartful have been held apart, but we see no reason why you can't have sort of silky blankets uh, in a stack of concrete. Uh, and the fourth and final property was a, a sort of double physics. So there are the blankets that still carry the trace of their arrested simulation in a digital environment. So they're responding to a gravity and a wind that's not literally present in the library. Um, but there's also another physics uh, that's composited together with that, that digital one, and that's just the blunt presence of real weight. Uh, um, which I think is legible in both the, uh, the culvert and the, the stacked bricks. And then, uh, of course, as we're, we're drawing this to present it and advertise, um, we sort of go back and re-flatten the picture uh, by practicing looking through the culvert at various aspects of this thing uh, so that it's kind of all of its spatial properties are, again, sort of uh, remapped to the picture plane and once again uh, sort of exclusively graphic. All right. Um, now, the last of the, the six projects, um, this is where I'm once again going to be a little bit coy in terms of what it is and where it is. We're going to call it just project for a festival. <laughs> um, this is something that's, that's currently in progress in our office and it has this sort of um, there's a, there's a unique working relationship with the client where we are proposing and reproposing various schematic designs. Um, and, you know, that's of course not unusual in any office, but um, now we're on maybe our ninth or tenth version of this same uh, pavilion for, for an upcoming festival. Uh, and, and, and maybe we'll be asked to do uh, sort of nine or ten more. Um, so, I don't know, take this for what you're about to see as like a few things in, in a very long series that may continue. Uh, so the story of the project really starts with an observation about um, landscape painting, uh, particularly uh, Chinese landscape painting in the 16th century, where there is a practice of painting and sometimes drawing hills to exaggerate their anthropomorphic qualities as though there is a body underneath. And there is actually uh, a language of connoisseurship that has to do with uh, your ability to either detect the body or, or, or not in these drawings. Uh, and that was interesting to us because uh, there is a kind of affiliation between that anthropomorphic landscape and the way that hipsters dress at festivals like the kind that we're, we're considering, which is that they wear ponchos and blankets uh, and sometimes sleeping bags, and they start actually to approximate landforms uh, because they are so sort of overburdened uh, with their poncho and their blanket. Uh, and this isn't eccentric, this isn't specific only to sort of festival culture, uh, this is a thing uh, in contemporary fashion, and so here's uh, a Burberry men's show from the 2016 uh, winter collection where, in fact, all of the blankets, or I'm sorry, all of the models come out wearing blankets. So the, now the blanket is sort of uh, substituting for a coat or a shirt. Uh, and so we thought a couple of things. The first is that we could actually literalize this relationship. If, if landscapes want to be people and people want to be landscapes, they're sort of not so far away from one another already. And so we have this uh, series of drawings that just kind of underscore the ease with which we can cause one to kind of melt into the other. Uh, but then maybe there's a missing term, which is that if landscapes want to be people, uh, and people want to be landscapes, uh, maybe buildings might want to get on the act too and wear their own poncho. Uh, and so what you're seeing here are a, a series of three pavilions um, arrayed next to one another, and each one is wearing this uh, sort of garment um, that has a, a sort of hood or, and folds and pleats uh, so that the building is, is wearing clothes that are, are kind of like the festival goers. Um, and so this requires thinking about the kind of body uh, underneath, the, um, underneath the drapery of, of the kind of landform of the pavilion. 
And so um, we were very interested in thinking through like what body could possibly be underneath that blanket uh, and sort of uh, motivating its distortions. Uh, and so here I'd like to move, please, to the, the double projection image. And so you can see us sort of thinking through. Uh, and this is the image I'd like to talk about for a moment. Um, and so as we're trying to create that body underneath uh, the drapery or the poncho, um, we want that to be simultaneously beholden to two sets of demands. The first you can see on the top, which is that we want some very legible pitched roofs uh, that are more or less drawn from uh, those angles from conventional roof construction. And the second is that, so if that accounts for the sort of short or frontal elevation, the second demand that we would place on that body underneath the blanket uh, is in the long elevation where there's a kind of posture or hunch. So of course, uh, in architecture, uh, if you have two elevations, uh, you very nearly have a building. Normally, you would just project those until they meet one another, and maybe there's a process of Boolean subtraction, and you get the kind of result. We wanted to add um, a sort of wrinkle to that, where we would insist that a box actually do the work of drawing that front elevation and the hunch. Uh, so there is no infinitely plastic sort of uh, conceptual material that reconciles the two drawings. Uh, instead, it's a, it's a literal piece of material um, that unfolds with six sides and behaves more like a, a cardboard box. And so what that creates is in the long elevation of the project, uh, a kind of jumbled series of hunches, uh, almost like a, a series of animals that are uh, sort of lining up next to one another, but a very different effect in the plan, um, where this set of pavilions is organized in an isosceles triangle uh, around a, a kind of center point so that all of the pitched roofs that are more reminiscent of, uh, let's say, resi residential construction are legible from a sort of very precise point uh, on the like, interior of the, the collection of pavilions. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this has changed uh, over time, and we've done it again and again. Um, according to uh, various client requests. Uh, and maybe I could um, just characterize how it's changing. Um, so over time, we've been working in simpler, bigger chunks. And I would say that there's also a kind of clearer mapping of these discrete objects to some legible form of wholeness or unity. So the isosceles triangle uh, was perhaps just the first step in that direction. But we're asking things as we move on to give up a little bit more of their discreteness and give up a little bit of their independence um, and maybe participate in uh, the construction of some kind of, of legible unity. And I think that's uh, characteristic of some of our newer work. Um, and I think maybe that's, that's saying that we're asking, as we're reducing the quantity, but also more clearly mapping them onto uh, this unity, I think we're asking of two things of our work simultaneously. One is for uh, the thing and the individual object to be more present, and then secondly, uh, to be somehow more subordinate. So uh, essentially amplifying the two uh, halves uh, of a project like this. Um, so in closing, I would just like to maybe make the case for uh, this work of sufficient density uh, in terms of a very particular relationship with uh, contemporary culture. So yes, we're finding excuses in the history of architecture to insert ourselves where we can, um, but there is a, a kind of plan here uh, that has to do with our observations of the world around us. Um, and maybe I would express these ambitions toward co contemporaneity uh, in a series of, of four points. So the first is maybe everything is a brick. Um, it does not matter whether source material is high or low or whether it is specifically designated as architectural, as in like a door frame. Uh, but 
the field of uh, available objects for our use is, is much flatter, uh, and I don't actually see a way of excluding anything. Um, and I would argue that this is a sustainable position. Uh, it doesn't require, architecture doesn't require the use of objects that have a great deal of energy input to make a kind of decorative finish, as in linoleum. Uh, you can really use anything. Um, the second point would be, so if the first is everything is a brick, the second point would be that nothing is automatically architecture. So it doesn't, just because something happens to be a kind of quotation from history, it doesn't mean uh, that it's been arranged in such a way that it produces spatial qualities that actually rise to the occasion of architecture. Um, that's a totally different story and is up for argument and that's actually where, where the kind of hard work lies. Um, the third point would be perhaps um, everything is outside. So if architecture is a sufficiently dense collection of things, I'm not so interested in inquiring into the interior of those things, but I am very interested in designing their exterior surfaces that I would characterize as elevations. Uh, and that's a continuous public elevation, let's say. Uh, which then maybe leads me to my, my final point, uh, which would be that uh, communities are entangled by their relations to things, such that an adjustment to any one of architecture's bricks necessarily uh, impacts constituencies in the round. Um, and to us, this is a profoundly hopeful politics of engagement. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so we want to find a way to re-spatialize the lecture so that it becomes uh, like subject to design in the same way that all the things that we do in a building like this are subject to design. So it seemed like if I'm advocating for a certain kind of approach, um, that it might be good just to extend that even to the lecture and like refuse the slide as a, as a convention. Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> so that was fun. I think it would uh, actually be pretty simple, which is basically um, if a lot of, if coherence in architecture is normally authorized by a line that begins with Kant and moves through people like Wittkover and gives us these sort of fundamental diagrams that are lurking behind the visible stuff but guarantee its coherence, I just want to start backward, which is begin with the visible stuff and see if I can come up with other abstractions behind it. So uh, let's say rather than beginning with the Greek cross and playing around with the solid material that can limb its boundaries in you know, an incredible number of ways, uh, 
I'd just start with the solid material and see if I can derive the Greek cross, which, uh, if the project is successful, probably wouldn't at the end of the day be a Greek cross anymore. We would have uh, sort of added another kind of abstraction to our catalog. And is simply No, I mean, um, so as we work backward, I think maybe that's where the politics come into play. And I'll absolutely agree with you that the political dimension is uh, maybe nascent, but not yet explicitly constructed any of the projects. So where we would like to uh, sort of realize some of our, our communal and political ambitions, but haven't really figured out a way to do it uh, yet. So, but anyway, I, I think working backward would give us hope that it's possible to uh, sort of open architecture to larger constituencies. Um, in a way that's very difficult to conceive of if you are always mapping solid material to reinscribe the boundary of this thing that's been known forever. Yeah, basically just drawing lines around its perimeter. Uh, and we, we'd like to open that up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, familiarity for sure, and, and taste as well, but that maybe makes me a little less com comfortable. So um, maybe if a, a kind of fashion and contemporary architecture is to fetishize estrangements, I would say that that's a strong interest in defamiliarizing the world around us. Um, I'm maybe more interested in the way in which certain kinds of familiarity offer themselves up to habit and use, but do it in unexpected ways. So I'm not so much interested in architecture withdrawing to the point where we can't use it or sort of take it up discursively. I'd like it to be familiar and legible enough that, like, a, I don't know, a knife still looks like a knife. <laughs> um, how taste fits into that? I, I don't know. Maybe the, um, the balloon animal project is the clearest example. So if we want to develop things that are familiar, but familiar in a very specific way, we have to develop in our office our own taste cultures to tell us when we've got it right. Um, and I, I think that's why we make diagrams that help us sort things. Um, to try to know like what's good and what's bad in the absence of exterior external criteria that would give us any clue. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I I also really appreciated it. it was a very fun lecture, but it was also at the same time incredibly dense. Uh, there was a certain density of thoughts as well as objects. Um, but you know, one thing I found was that. This idea of the density works really well in the work that is at a certain scale. Um, and when it starts to go, you know, one slightly larger scale project is the restaurant, right? And it doesn't, how, maybe the question is, it, it felt like it wasn't as much about that same concept. Sure. And how do you imagine this? Do you, imagine, do you care if this scales up to the scale of what we would? Call architecture, yeah, or, or as opposed to installation, or does that matter to you? Do you hope that that happens, or do you imagine the work shifting? Are you, yeah, yeah? So it matters very much, um, and uh, we want bigger things. I think we're running up against. Uh, a couple of things. So one is a sort of hangover from installation culture, which is maybe not so present for this generation of students as it was for maybe my generation, but we learned by making installations, and now we're, we're 
those are the tools with which we were very familiar and now we're, we're practicing in sort of other ways. Our, I wouldn't characterize our work as being exclusively installation based in the early years. We always did stuff like ski boot stores and things like that. But in any case, like in terms of the hardcore tools, we have a hangover from that culture. So I think that's, a, that's well observed. Uh, I think maybe the second hang up that we're sort of in the process of expunging uh, would basically be like I-beams. So uh, we're very comfortable with a brick or some dirt or a piece of cloth as the kind of objects that we'll include. Maybe a little less comfortable with bigger stuff that's more familiar to the discipline. Um, but I see no reason why we couldn't start to incorporate those as well. And we're, we're trying in, in some newer work. Yeah. Um, great. Well, I would just like to say thank you guys uh, so much again. You are a very uh, patient and wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you.